It's a bit past 7 o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you know what time it is. It's time for your weekly episode of SCV Chat. I'm your host for the evening, Moose. And before we get started, please remember, the views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are not necessarily the views and opinions of the SCV, its GEC, nor any divisions, brigade, camps, or any other subsidiaries. How is everybody doing in Dixieland tonight? I see Mr. Sean from Look Around Florida checking in. Miss Linda, good to see you. Past Commander-in-Chief Paul Gramlin Jr. checking in. Steve, Mr. Steve, I see you in the chat. All right, Mr. Jeff, how are you? Okay. Now, before I bring him on, because I know he would stop me for saying all of these good things about our guest tonight, we have a list. I, I, I asked Dr. Mitchum for this list a while ago. And it was really just so I can have a lot of his accomplishments and a lot of his past titles in the SEV, just so I could say them every time he comes on, because it is just phenomenal what he has done uh, for the cause, for history itself, not just about the war between the states. So here, here is just an ounce, as always, of what this man has done. Born in Louisiana... Dr. Mitchum attended Northeast Louisiana University, North Carolina State University, and the University of Tennessee to get his Ph.D. Let's see here. He has wrote, written over or authored more than 40 books, including It Wasn't About Slavery, Exposing the Great Lie of the Civil War, Bust Hell Wide Open, Life of Nathan Bedford Forrest, Vicksburg, The Bloodiest Siege That Turned the Tide of the Civil War, Let's see here. Richard Taylor and the Red River Campaign, the death of Hitler's war machines, and many more, including many more that we have talked about on the chat, and including his tonight of, let's see if I can get the, get the nice picture of his cover we have here for him. Here, it's all the way at the bottom because I didn't move it. All right, Voices from the Confederacy, the Civil War, Civil war Stories, from the men and women of the Old South. So, again, we all know Dr. Mitchum is very well accomplished. He has done a lot for the SCV and, again, history in general. So without any further ado, let's welcome our very special guest tonight, Dr. Samuel Mitchum, Jr. How you doing, Thank Dr. You. Mitchum? Doing great. How about you, Miss? <laughs> good. Good, good, good. And people are... Uh, already talking about your general's book that you talked about last time you were on, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, uh, that was fun. Um, uh, that was my magnus opus. Uh, average <laughs> book was 60 to 70,000 words. That one was 252,000 words. And uh, that was... And now the publisher is talking about uh, me doing another encyclopedia, this time of uh, U.S. Army generals in World War II. Um, we're discussing it. Um, I would really rather do the German generals. Uh, I wrote uh, over well, around 30 books on the German Wehrmacht, the German armed forces in World War II. And uh, I would... We'll see. We'll see. We'll find out this week. Yeah, let's let's give this man credit where credit is due because I don't think people realize how hard it is the research, writing the book in general, publishing, doing the promotion. Because uh, for those who don't know, I'm trying to currently write my first book. Who, 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 the the level of respect you will get for these great authors we have on the show will hit you very quickly. Uh, so, you know, for, to be sitting here with someone that has written so many great books and historical books and over, I think it was over 30, over 40. Uh, it's over 40. I, my wife says we've reached 50. I don't really know. I, lost I, count. I stopped counting at 40. <laughs> but that is just phenomenal in itself. And I'm excited to hear about the book tonight. I think you, you talked to me about it. A uh, a while ago, and I think you sparked my interest then. So I'm looking forward to this. Someone asked, you can write. 
Uh, yes, I be I should be able to. I pay uh, around five grand <laughs> to a university every couple of months to make sure I can write. So if I can't, then um, I need to tell my family they need to get their money back. <laughs> what do you want to write a book about? Uh, what's your first book about? Um, I'm writing one on. Um, I don't know if I want to keep it a surprise or not. I. Uh, I, I talk, I've talked to a couple people about it, but I guess um, it's okay to talk to say it. Uh, I want to try to write a book about um, Dr. McCain, uh, kind of a, a bio and his history in the SCV and what all he did for the SCV. Because uh, you know, as a Mississippian SCV member, it's even worse that. I don't hear about him much anymore. And I had been, a mem I've been a member for 11 years. Mm. And I had no idea about Dr. Mitchum. He came from my own state, you know? And so I, uh, when I was asked to be division historian, uh, they asked me if I could do something for Dr. McCain. And this is a personal thing. This is not the division. Uh, I decided just to take all the research I've gathered for this and uh, try my best. Yes, it is a big subject for the first book I'm reading. I tried my best to get out of it. And then a couple of people heard about it and they have been asking me updates ever since. So I decided I was going to give it my best shot. I hope it's good. If it's not good, then I guess I just need to hide my head in shame and Connor can fire me from the show and y'all don't have to hear about me anymore. Uh. Uh, <laughs> just just disappears. Uh, I, I, will, I will buy one of Dr. Mitchum's degrees and put it behind me. Um, but <laughs> getting off that subject and getting on your new book, we have a couple of questions. And remember, people, please send in your questions to Dr. Mitchum about his book. We'll be talking about it uh, and we'll answer a first the first couple of questions. And uh, then we'll hopefully have some response from the crowd. So the first, uh, do you have something you want to say about the book first, actually? Well, first, uh, we had a uh, uh, Confederate trivia uh, contest um, about a week ago on this show, and I wanted to correct a couple of things. First of all, uh, Jefferson Davis's middle name is not El Nice. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was Finnis. Uh, the, the computer, uh, El Nice Davis is a lady that goes to our church, and uh, <laughs> the computer kept putting in, uh, using, I guess, that autocorrect system. Uh, mm -hmm. Every time I typed Jefferson Davis, it would put in Jefferson L. Nice Davis, which made me look a little foolish, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it does that. It um, On one jack dust jacket, it uh, corrected the spelling of my name. Uh, but uh, we caught that uh, on this book. Uh, uh, Jason Bashirs was kind enough to endorse it, and uh, the computer uh, at the publishers decided he needed an A in his name, and uh, I didn't have a chance to catch it. I'm sorry, uh, Jason. It just showed up. It, I know how to spell your name. <laughs> uh, oh, it's, it takes a computer to really mess things up. Uh, I yes, wanna, I agree more. <laughs> I did want to mention uh, Earl Van Dorn. There's some question about his death. I noticed some people uh, open their eyes big when I bring it up. Um, for oh, well over a century, the uh, Peters family wanted everybody to think that Dr. George Peters shot Earl Van Dorn because uh, he was fooling around with Peter's wife. Well, yeah, he was, but if he'd killed everybody that fooled around with his wife, he'd have been a mass murderer because she was an infomaniac. Uh, Peters didn't kill him for that. Peters killed him because he was also fooling around with Claire, um, uh, Dr. Peters' 14-year-old daughter, and got her pregnant. And um, there was a professor down at Holmes County Community College, uh, uh, Professor... Uh, uh, Bridget Smith wrote a book about it, Where Elephants Fault. And uh, yeah, I was always wondering why he, was there more to it? And um, that's the best piece of forensic history uh, I've ever seen. Uh, she did introduce a fictionalized uh, uh, diary to 
help the reader understand the process, but um, left no doubt in my mind. And she had detectives hired and uh, uh, did DNA. Um, yeah, it, it's, you shouldn't mess around with 14 year old daughters, especially if they have fathers who know how to shoot. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I wanted to clarify that. Uh, uh, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. Uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell, without going into too much detail, uh, my first question would just be, what can you tell us about this book without, I guess the word would be spoiling too much about it? Well, there's, it's a lot of war stories. Uh, you know, I, Encyclopedia of Confederate Generals uh, so, uh, took the, the higher level officers, mm -hmm. uh, the strategy and so forth. Uh, but you got to remember, for most Confederates, the war was 100 yards wide. And I discuss a lot of that. I discuss uh, the women. Um, I gained a great deal of respect for them in the course of uh, uh, this research. And the slaves. I, uh, but in the Old South, they, they used the term slave, but mostly it was servant. They called them servants. And I found some really interesting stories. Uh, one of my favorites was uh, Ida Lee Adkins. She was eight years old when the Yankees came. Um, Ida Lee uh, liked her master. Um, he treated her well. He'd go to Raleigh. It's about 60 miles away and get uh, get a candy. She had a sweet tooth. Uh, he'd get her gumdrops or hard rock candy or something. She really liked him. She didn't like her uh, mistress very much. I call the leader, her the old miss. Because um, um, I'd really like to try to steal sugar. And uh, every time she'd try to get a sugar cube, uh, uh, mistress would catch her. Uh, Idly said she had uh, eyes in the back of her head. And there was, she didn't say it, but there probably was a spanking involved because <laughs> that generation believed in spare the rod, spoil the child. They rarely did it. But when the Yankees came, she was eight years old and uh, the, the master fired at him with a single shot rifle. He, fortunately for him, he missed. The Yankees grabbed him and tied him up and uh, started looting the plantation and uh, stealing the silverware, but more importantly, the food. And I really knew that if uh, something wasn't done, uh, they wouldn't have anything to eat in short order. Um, and so she tried to cut Master loose, and uh, a Yankee sergeant, I won't say exactly what he said, but uh, uh, he was going to cut her tongue out. Well, she escaped out the back, and... Uh, uh, she had a brilliant idea. She, um, at, at that time in North Carolina, there was no sugar. Uh, if they wanted to sweeten something, you had to use watermelon juice or honey. And uh, they had bee gums or bee boxes. And uh, she grabbed a limb and knocked over the bee gums and stirred up the bees until she could said I could smell the poison. And then she ran into the middle of the Union Cavalry Detachment with the bees in hot pursuit. And they started stinging Yankees and stinging horses. You know, some of the Yankees were on the horses, some were holding them, others were looting. There were bees all over the place and the, the horses were bucking and uh, pulling away and throwing Yankees high into the air. And the Yankees were cursing, but as I at least said, what well, does a bee care if you curse it? And uh, the horses broke away and the Yankees, uh, were being stung by the bees. They dropped the loot. They dropped the food. They had uh, stuffed silverware and uh, pillowcases. They dropped that. And um, the horses ran away. The Yankees ran after the horses. And she said some of the Yankees ran faster than the horses. And uh, the whole Union Cavalry detachment was totally routed by an 18-year-old eight African-American. <laughs> a unique occurrence in American history. And uh, Idly, uh, uh, the mistress said, Idly, you have saved us all. And she took a gold ring from her own finger and put it on Idly's. 
And when Ida Lee was interviewed by the uh, Federal Writers and the Federal Writer Project about 1938, uh, she still had that gold ring on her finger. It was probably the only, you know, given the poverty of the Reconstruction and New South era, it's probably the only uh, piece of jewelry she ever had. She's very proud of it. Uh, I thought that was a good story. Yeah. That was an awesome story. And uh, going back to what you just said, though, you said you gained a lot of respect for the women during this time. So, you know, the next question I'd like to ask you, how important were the Confederate women to the Southern War effort? Uh, indispensable. Without them, the Southern economy would have collapsed long before the Union soldiers showed up. Um, and they kept them in the field. They, they were uh, strong Confederates. I know up here at uh, Farmerville, Louisiana, there's a story of the... Uh, all the boys volunteered except for one. He was able-bodied, but he didn't want to go to war. And uh, they couldn't shame him into it. So one day a herd of women took him down on the sidewalk and dressed him in a dress. And I don't know if they put makeup on him or not, but I hope they did. Uh, Me they, too. <laughs> General Sherman... Uh, had a run in with them in Savannah. He ordered all the Confederate women out and they packed their suitcases. We're going to leave, but uh, the Union officers decided they want to search the suitcases. And the women said, You will not. I will not allow you to poke around in my underwear. And uh, the argument ended up uh, at, uh, at General Sherman. And uh, he said, you Southern women are the hardest cases I ever saw. If it hadn't been for you, the men would have given up long ago. And he turned to his officers and said, leave their suitcases alone. So I mean, <laughs> scored a minor victory. Um, I like the one about the Arkansas lady. Uh, the Confederate army was retreating and, uh, and she was, the woman that ran the plantation when the man was out to war was called the old miss. Didn't matter. If she's 19 years old. She was the old miss. And the old miss stopped the commander of the Confederate rear guard and said, uh, are you going to fight the Yankees before they get to my plantation? And the, uh, the officer said, no, we're not. The Yankees are uh, two miles that way. Uh, they'll be here in 30 minutes. And he rode off. Well, she knew if they got in her storehouse, they wouldn't have anything to eat. So um, what she did, uh, thinking quickly, she ran in there, grabbed a ham, stuck a knife in it, twisted it, made a hole, and told the servants, throw this out in the yard. And she did that with every piece of meat in the storehouse, mostly hams, sides of beef too. But uh, uh, they just, just had finished when the Yankees showed up, and the Union commander was astonished. He said, what are all these hands doing in the yard? And she told him, uh, well, uh, the uh, Confederate cavalry did that. And you can have them if you wish, but uh, don't blame me if your men die of poisoning. And he saw that hole in the side of the hands and he decided that must be where the rebels poured the poison. Uh, so when the Yankees left, not one ham had been disturbed. Um, they they did everything. They, uh, Confederacy had no medical department to speak of, and they uh, they ran the hospitals. Uh, one of them was Phoebe Pender, who was a Jewish lady and widow. Uh, no medical background, but the Secretary of War uh, asked her to set up a hospital and run it. And uh, she said, I don't know anything about running a hospital. And he said, well, neither does anybody else. But I know you're competent and you can do it. And uh, so she did. <laughs> and she became the administrator of um, Chimborazo Hospital there in Richmond, which is now the home of the Confederate Medical Museum. And uh, during her uh, tenure, she uh, treated uh, 76,000 wounded Confederates, <coughs> sick Confederates, occasionally a Yankee. And uh, it was the biggest hospital in the Richmond area. In 1955, they even uh, made a U.S. postage stamp off with her likeness on it. 
That was awesome. Yeah, she was an awesome lady. There were, <coughs> pardon me, there were several of them. Uh, I'm reading about one, a uh, couple of Arkansas boys got leave and went home, but their homes were now behind Union lines. And uh, they were visiting uh, one of the boys' sisters when the Union Cavalry pulled up in the front yard. And uh, one of the boys shimmied up the chimney, and the other one went under one of the ladies' dresses, under the hoop skirt. She was leaned against the uh, fireplace pretending to read with this man under her dress. And the Yankees searched the entire house, didn't find any of them, and uh, decided the story must they must have been misled. The story must be false. So it rode off and the Confederates escaped. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the women were indispensable. Um, uh, sewing. Um, there was nothing they wouldn't do. And I like say, like General Sherman said, they were tougher than the men in many cases. <laughs> that they were. And, uh, Good to see that uh, not a lot of things have changed in the SCV as a lot of our men will sh say that their, their wives are probably the brains behind the operations. But uh, going on to the, the next question, talked about uh, a hospital there for a minute, which leads into this next question. What kind of Medicare, medical care did the Southerners receive? Well, the best that they could under the circumstances, there was a shortage of every drug. Uh, many of them uh, had to use whiskey for anesthetic. I found out one thing, which, uh, you know, the Yankees suffered um, 380,000 deaths. The Confederates suffered about uh, 240,000 deaths. Uh, I was interested in the uh, disparity. Um, you know, they had more guns than we did, uh, so they had more bullets going at us than we did at them. Why did they suffer so much more loss? And of course, one of the reasons was we had uh, superior officers. But another was uh, the Confederate medical uh, uh, doctors uh, used uh, racks to trip to take care of the wounded. Um, they would uh, uh, sterilize them, uh, use one uh, piece of cloth on a particular soldier, and then they throw it in a barrel. They wouldn't use it again in that battle. And of course, at the end of the battle, they would have uh, barrels full of bloody rags, and they would boil them and sterilize them and fold them and get ready for the next battle. The Yankees didn't use the rags. They used sponges. And uh, you can imagine that if you were wounded and uh, they used a sponge, it's still got my blood on it as the previous patient, and our blood types are different, uh, you could easily come down with blood poisoning. And uh, the fact that you're wounded in a uh, diminished state of health anyway, uh, that could easily push you over the edge and into the grave. And uh, uh, I thought that was uh, rather interesting. The, uh, although uh, neither side had particularly good medical care, over half the surgeons on either side had never performed an operation before the war. And uh, battlefield's not a real good place to do on-the-job training <laughs> as a commander or as a medical person. Uh, one thing I found interesting uh, was um, what um, what changed over time. When the Confederates uh, first took the field, uh, I found a, a list of a, a young man wrote what they carried. It was incredible. You may know men who uh, uh, camp like that. They carry every convenience. Uh, why are you camping? You know, you've got... Uh, hammocks and generators and um, I saw one with a fussing because his little television set wouldn't work well in the woods. Uh, 
and every convenience of life, uh, not exactly roughing it. Well, that's the way the Confederate volunteers started out. Yankees too, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, they had heavy boots with thick soles. I'll read you a little list. Heavy double-breasted coat with long skirt. Huge, long overcoat, frequently including a cape. They had a knapsack, which contained a full load of underwear, soap, towels, comb, brush, toothpaste, toothbrush, writing paper, envelopes, pens, inks, pencils, boot polish, smoking tobacco, chewing tobacco, pipes, cotton bandages, needles, threads, buttons, table knife, fork, and spoon. It weighed to 20, 25 pounds. And that was just that. On the outside, they had two folded blankets and a rubber oil cloth. Um, they also had a not only the knapsack, but a haversack, which was loaded down with provisions, a canteen full of water, and revolvers, bowie knives, rifles, and bayonets. In addition to that, each mess, a mess was five to ten men, had a large chest, camp chest, and it contained a skillet, frying pan, coffee boiler, coffee box, uh, lard bucket, salt box, sugar box, meal box, flour box, along with plates and cups, etc. And uh, eight to ten of these chests would fill a Confederate Army wagon. And uh, each company also had several tents and uh, small iron stoves with stove pipes. And the officers also had valises. Um, and each company had a small wagon train. Um, and that changed rapidly. The principle became the less baggage, less labor. Early in the war, you could trace the movement of Confederate unit from the equipment that they discarded. Um, the knapsack disappeared almost altogether, and uh, as did clean clothes. Mm. Underwear disappeared. The uh, typical soldier consisted of one man with one hat, one shirt, one pair of trousers, one uh, pair of uh, drawers, uh, and maybe socks and shoes, but only one pair of uh, each. Wow. And, uh, they had a cartridge box, and some men disposed with that. Uh, they just put the bullets in their pockets, carried everything there. Canteens were replaced with cups because uh, of the weight. Uh, just get a, a tin cup, stop at a creek, drink your fill, and don't drink again till you come to another stream. There were plenty of them. Gloves were discarded. Revolvers were sent home. There were little use against the Yankees, but Mama might need it to, have, to take care of outlaws and ruffians. Bayonets were discarded. Uh, camp chests were scrapped. And um, the cotton shirt replaced the flannel, flannel shirt because uh, it was easier to wash cotton. And the vermin didn't populate the cotton shirt as badly as it did the uh, flannel shirt. So everything changed. Tents disappeared largely. Uh, they would take, two men would get together, they'd lay down the um, oil cloth, uh, they would get underneath it, they would uh, have two blankets, and on top of them they put the second oil cloth in case it rained. In fact, once, uh, read about Pickett's division, it stopped in North Carolina, and uh, soldiers saw it, and uh, it went to sleep. It was a clear sky. When they woke up, they had about three inches of snow. And uh, all these men got up at once with Reveille and uh, said, it looked like a mass resurrection. <laughs> People coming out. <laughs> uh, they uh, uh, dispensed with the wagons, you know, except for uh, ammunition, quartermaster, and uh, commissary stores. Food was primitive. Uh, they cooked uh, bacon in a pan, got it about half full, and then uh, had boiling grease. And they'd uh, pour in flour mixed with water uh, and stir it rapidly, creating a brown gravy. Uh, and it was ready to serve. 
they had bacon, they had gravy, and uh, of course you had hardtack, which um, I am told if you soak it in water long enough and fry it in bacon grease, it's actually edible. I don't know. I've got a piece over here. I, I've never ha- never eaten any, <laughs> but I uh, I keep a uh, I keep a piece handy in case I need to knock down a fully grown buffalo. Um, and that was their meal. They um, pretty incredible what they uh, uh, what they endured. Um, I got a question from Victor Smith. Did uh, think the war boosted uh, the evolution and the design of artificial limbs? Um, mm, no, not really. Uh, after the war, there were um, heavy appropriations. Uh, the largest item on the Mississippi budget in, uh, at, you know, after the surrender, 1865-1866, was purchasing artificial limbs for disabled Confederate veterans. One source said that took up 65% of the budget. Uh, but... Uh, uh, they uh, uh, no major breakthroughs in the design of the artificial limb that I'm aware of. Uh, before we continue, we're going to let uh, hit our sponsors real quick and hit a quick pop tart break, and we will get back. Doctor Mitchum, we still have a couple things of uh, questions for him, so make sure to t- stay tuned. Make sure to share this episode, and let's get it out here. Let's get Doctor Mitchum. Some more views for his book because it, it is going to be a phenomenal book. I cannot w- wait myself to read it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and so, but talking about books, let us talk about, let's see if we can, there he is. In General Beauregard's Defense by Past Commander in Chief Larry McClooney Jr. Uh, of course, in General Beauregard's Defense, past hundred years or so, General Beauregard has gotten a lot of flack. In this book, uh, it proceeds like a court case where Commander, uh, past Commander McClooney defends General Beauregard and shows us who he believes is the real man behind all of the lies and all of the jabs that we hear our Confederate generals. And then Onward to Vicksburg is a great book. I got that my freshman year of college. Lovely book. Uh, And then the Yazoo Pass Exposition, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the few books on this particular event. And it's Connor's favorite because, as always, he's mentioned in the forward. Mm. (laughs) So please go check out our sponsor, Past Commander-in-Chief. Larry McClooney Jr. And you can check out his books if you're interested in any any of them at the website link below in the chat at www.larrymcclooney.com. And without further ado, please also remember that our Pop-Tart Breaks are sponsored by the Confederate Legion. You can go to www.makedixiegrady.org and join the Confederate Legion today. I got into the SCV after receiving an award back when I was in high school. I had no clue what the SCV was. All I knew was that it was a rebel flag and it was supposed to be racist. I decided I would go and look further into it. Everything that we're taught from a very young age is that the Confederacy was wrong. They were treasonous. But it turns out it wasn't just because the South had slaves. This is because of the very fundamental principle of big government. There's nothing more American than keeping the government in line. It's what we were bred to do. It comes down from 1776, Declaration of Independence. It's because we decided to keep a government that we've deemed tyrannical in line. That's what the true definition of the cause is. Me being a young black American and being a part of the Sons of Confederate Veterans is a shock to a lot of people. The black Confederate soldier 
would have had to have been one of the hardest working soldiers there was. These are men who decided to take up a cause because in the end, it was their own cause. In fact, most owners wanted the slaves to stay back because that was how they were steadily making income. They made a choice to do something that was bigger than themselves. That's why, as a black confederate now, it is my duty that I owe them to do something greater than myself. Confederate history is American history, and you cannot separate the two. I am Sammy Travis, descendant of Private Benjamin Rowe, a Confederate veteran. Always love that face video. Uh, oh, yeah, it brings a tear to the eye. Oh, yes, sir. And, of course, our last sponsor for the day, the sponsor that Connor did behind my back. Uh, but I love the sponsor, though. Sponsored by 75, uh, our 1175 Firearms Training. The Moose Fact of the week, r- week is Mooses are really smart, and they are, and most are able to write books. Uh, that is the Moose Fact for the Week. And without further ado, we... <laughs> Uh, without further ado, we will get back to uh, Dr. Mitchum's questions because uh, this is the one I've been looking forward to ever since uh, I saw it and I started thinking about what it could be. Uh, that's one of my favorite things, uh, and I guess I'll talk a bit behind the scenes. Dr. Mitchum, you know, uh, he'll let us have question, make questions for him, and then he'll send a couple in. And what that does is makes you think, how good is this answer going to be? <laughs> Mm-hmm. And so this is one I've been waiting on. Uh, Dr. Mitchum, what are some of your favorite war stories? Uh, well, one of them um, you know, has got to be uh, Private Joe McBride. He was in the 45th Mississippi. And, um, and the Battle of Trahoon during the uh, uh, Stone River campaign, the Second Battle of Murfreesboro. Uh, he and his uh, company commander, Captain Connor, were cut off by a Union cavalry foray. Well, they took off, and uh, it had rained earlier, and uh, they came to a fence, and they couldn't climb it because it was too wet. And they were surrounded by the Union cavalry, and they ordered them to throw up their hands, and Captain Connor did. But uh, not Joe McBride. He threw himself on the Union commander. He was a major, knocked him off the horse, and... Uh, before they could get him off, he'd bitten off one of the man's fingers. And um, the Yankees, some of the Yankees wanted to kill him. And others said, no, uh, he's a prisoner. We can't kill him. Uh, so they took him to the brigade commander, who was General Peter uh, Oberhaus, who was a Prussian. He was from Germany. Uh, one of Lincoln's mercenaries, I suppose, although he did stay in the army and retired. Uh, from the U.S. Army, moved back to Germany. He didn't die until 1917. And um, they said, what do you want to to do with him, uh, General uh, Osterhaus? And he looked him up and down, probably made McBride uncomfortable. And he said, uh, I want you to accord him every respect due a prisoner of war, and I want every one of you to fight just like he did. Um. Anyway, I like that story. And uh, oh, Vicksburg, uh, they were paying uh, uh, $3.50 for rats. And uh, that's how hungry they were. If you can imagine, you're making uh, $11 a month as a Confederate private, and you pay a week's over a week's wages for a single rat. Uh, You have an idea of how hungry they were. And uh, Oh, Phil Robertson's a good friend of mine. He's the Duck Dynasty fellow. We uh, sit by each other in church every Sunday. And he was talking about his relative. He was in the same uh, 
his great great grandfather was in the same regiment as mine, the uh, 31st Louisiana. And uh, uh, he led his boys, uh, they, they found a, a dog uh, which gave birth to puppies, and he let the men eat the puppies, but he kept the mama and wouldn't let anybody kill her. And he nursed off that dog. And uh, he said he gave uh, he gave that dog credit for saving his life. Said hadn't been for that dog, he'd have starved. He was a walking skeleton at the end anyway. Uh, uh, the uh, oh, uh, there are all kinds of stories. Dodging was an issue early in the war. Uh, uh, it. Uh, there, there was a division of opinion. Should gentlemen dodge? And uh, uh, some people said, no, Southern soldiers should never dodge. Others said, I'm not going to uh, be killed just to keep up appearances. I'm going to dodge. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it happened during the uh, 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 retreat up the peninsula. Uh, there was this captain, and he had to deliver a message to General Jeb Stewart. And to do it, he had to cross this field, which uh, was covered by fire from by Union artillery battery. And he took off at full speed, and they were firing cannons at him. And um, he was riding Comanche style. He was almost parallel to the ground. He had that horse between him and the Yankee artillery. And uh, he came. He uh, he successfully ne negotiated the field. Came up to General Stewart. And Stewart and his staff started making fun of him. And uh, he was unrepentant. And about that time, General Lee came up and um, they asked General Lee what side of the issue was he on. And he looked at the captain and said, you're right, Captain, dodge them all you can. And uh, <laughs> um, the captain got even later in the, in the war, in the Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, uh, General Stewart was at the edge of a wood line uh, observing the Yankees through his binoculars. And the uh, Union artillery fired a, a, a volley through, through the trees and then knocked over limbs and leaves and foliage. And Stewart hit the ground. He was covered by, uh, by foliage and uh, had dug his way out of the leaves. And as he did that, he looked up and there was the captain standing over him, laughing at him. So uh, the captain got his come up and says, I thought that was cool. Uh, <laughs> The one who, uh, uh, one of the ones who did not dodge was Stephen Dill Lee. Uh, he and Nathan Bedford Forrest and General Chalmers, who was Forrest's second in command um, during the Tennessee campaign, decided to observe uh, uh, Captain Walton's battery. Walton, a young man, he had a reputation for never missing with his artillery. And uh, by the time they got up there, uh, he had fired a few rounds. Uh, there was a Union artillery battalion on the other side of the uh, ridge line, uh, probably 60 guns. They didn't like being shot at. So they opened up and uh, uh, created bedlam. I, they hit an ammunition chest, blew up a caisson. Uh, uh, Chalmers hit the dirt. He, he looked up and he saw General Stephen Dill Lee sitting on his horse as if nothing was happening. He said, I felt bad, bad about it. Uh, so uh, a lieutenant rode up and there was General Forrest lying on the ground. He had dodged too. And he yelled at the lieutenant, get out of here, get out of here. And he said, uh, when he saw Forrest doing that, Chalmers said he felt better. Um, <laughs> Stonewall Jackson advocated dodging. Oh, he wouldn't dodge himself. Uh, one of the bravest men, uh, possibly the bravest of the Confederate generals, was Daniel Harvey Hill. He wouldn't dodge. In fact, if he saw somebody he thought was dodging too much, uh, he would call them over and make them stand at attention under enemy fire. Hey, you know, give me your musket, give me your rifle, whatever. And then um, Hill would shoot at the Yankees. And um, then they would, while he was standing at attention, uh, Evaluate Hill's shot. Did I hit him? Uh, is he dead? Uh, what? Uh, how did I miss? Was I left or right? And, uh, and after he uh, he got his uh, 
point across, he would let the enlisted man go back and hit the dirt again. But uh, and Daniel R.B. Hill wasn't afraid of anything. Uh, uh, here us von Brock was. He, uh, von Brock was uh, Prussian. Uh, he, uh, matter of fact, uh, the, uh, his grave is now in Poland. And the Russians destroyed it in uh, 1945, and the uh, SCV uh, rebuilt it. Uh, I think it was in the 1990s they uh, restored his uh, tombstone, and now uh, they have reenactments on his old uh, castle grounds. Uh, and the reenactors are from Poland, Germany, and uh, the Czech Republic. And they fly the Confederate flag, which I think is significant. Uh, it's still a uh, symbol used to defy tyranny. Mm -hmm. It was then, it is now. Uh, I remember seeing the Berlin Wall fall, and there was the Confederate battle flag. I remember uh, the uh, Solidarity riots, and once again, you saw the Confederate battle flag. So I thought that was significant. Bach, uh, uh, Bach is the uh, correct German pronunciation. Uh, he had some interesting stories. He, uh, uh, a Union heavy artillery shell passed very near him and uh, it knocked his horse down and knocked him down. He's searched his body and found that he wasn't wounded, but he figured his horse must have been killed. Turns out the horse wasn't wounded either. These heavy artillery shells create a vacuum when they pass, and nature hates the vacuum, and it just sucks the air out. And uh, it was close enough, it sucked up enough air to knock down both horse and rider. Uh, they call that windage. Uh, happened a number of times. Once he said he saw a bullock, uh, an ox, uh, do a somersault, a shell had landed near him, and he was sure the ox was dead. And he said, a minute or so later, the ox got up, shook his head, staggered like it was drunk, and took <laughs> off. <laughs> Wasn't seriously injured at all. Um, oh, there are all kinds of stories in this book. That's really what this book is about. It's a storybook. Um, I found a great one in the... Um, uh, United Confederate Veteran Reunion uh, of 1900. It was Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, Grant just, you know, central uh, Mississippi campaign. Uh, he took the city, took the town. And uh, uh, the owner uh, had a son who had been wounded and he was uh, in, in his bedroom. Uh, so they stashed him under the house so the Yankees wouldn't get him. Um, but there was a problem. He's so badly wounded. He groaned all the time. The older sister uh, covered for him by playing the piano and singing constantly for days on end. Well, uh, a, uh, his little sister was six years old, characterized mainly by curls. And uh, she uh, decided to take matters into her own hands. Uh, she went to General Grant's uh, bedroom, knocked on the door. General Grant opened the door and looked down and said, ask if he could help her. He said, yes, but first, uh, is, I have a secret. And uh, he said, I'd be very glad to hear it. And he said, first, you must cross your heart and hope to die uh, if you ever reveal our secret. You must promise to die in a minute. And uh, Grant said he would. And she said, well, say it. And he, she made General Grant cross his heart and uh, said, uh, my brother's underneath the house and he's wounded. <clears throat> and if we don't do something, the, the uh, bugs are going to eat him up. Well, uh, shortly thereafter, Grant uh, ran across the owner of the uh, mansion and said, I understand there's a uh, <coughs> Confederate soldier underneath the house. And uh, the owner said, well, what's that to you? And he said, only this. Uh, 
he should receive proper medical care and he should be in a bed. <coughs> so they got the boy out from under the house and put him in the bed and he eventually recovered and rejoined the army. Wow. Which I thought was a cool story. She didn't tell anybody about it for a long time. Afraid she'd get in trouble. <laughs> Oh, that was another one. There was a wounded rebel officer, and he was in pain. He he uh, violated the third commandment. He was using the Lord's name in vain. And uh, there was this beautiful seventeen-year-old Southern belle serving as a volunteer nurse. She didn't like it. She's Christian, and uh, she went over to the officer and uh, said. I think I heard you call upon the name of the Lord. I am one of his daughters. Is there anything uh, I can ask him uh, for you? And uh, he brightened up at the sight of a beautiful woman in the office. Officer, yes. Ask him to make me his son-in-law. <laughs> uh, there uh, all kinds of stories. Some of them are tragic. Some of them are funny. Uh, some are interesting. Uh, it uh, That's the purpose of the book is just to, uh, you know, it's not a great strategic study. It's, uh, but it does get across what the Southerner went through. Uh, man, uh, woman, uh, servant. Uh, and it's entertaining. That's the purpose. Uh, something yeah. you can read before you go to bed. It's uh, <laughs> um, and there's some other things, but um, no, that's the the gist of it. Uh, I was about to say, are you uh, you going to save those for uh, for surprises when people will get the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope they buy the book. Uh, Encyclopedia of Confederate Generals is selling very well. It'd be nice yeah. to follow up with this one. Um, uh, some funny things. Uh, old Jefferson Davis, uh, he wasn't noted for a sense of humor, but he had one. Uh, Mrs. R Roger Pryor read in the newspaper where her husband had uh, been promoted to Brigadier General. That same day, she had a reception at the Spotswood Hotel there in Richmond that President Davis attended. And uh, she walked up to Jefferson Davis and asked him, is it true? Was my husband made a Brigadier General? And uh, Davis said, Madam, I have no reason to doubt it, except for the fact that I read about it in the newspapers this morning. Uh, <laughs> And General Lee kind of felt the same way. Uh, he taught, was talking to A.P. Hill, and he said, uh, we had made a great mistake at the beginning of our struggle, and I fear, in spite of all we can do, it will prove to be a fatal mistake. We have appointed all our worst generals to command our armies, and all our best generals to edit our newspapers. So uh, uh, the Confederate high command didn't have much use for the newspapers. Uh, oh, there were others. Uh, um, I like one at the end of the war, Colonel uh, Brad, uh, Blackford, W.W. W. Blackford, the uh, lieutenant colonel in the 1st Virginia Engineers. Uh, he uh, went home and a thief stole a bridle that belonged to his daughter, or his pink bridle. Uh, he found out who it was and got five or six of the guys and they ran and had a counseling session with him, got the bridle back and made the man think they were about to lynch him. And it didn't, but uh, he wasn't sure about that. Scared him badly. Uh, meanwhile, Brad uh, Blackford had put his old war horse out to the pasture. A farmer let several officers put their uh, horses at, uh, in the pasture for no charge. And one night, uh, Rustler stole all the horses. And uh, the next day, Blackford's horse reappeared. His was the only horse 
that was returned. The outlaws had put it back where it was supposed to be. And later, uh, the out, they heard what the outlaw gang leader said, that he was afraid of Colonel Blackford. And if he'd ride 30 miles and beat a guy uh, over a girl's bridle, imagine what he would do for a whole horse. And uh, reputation counts, I suppose. Yes, sir. Uh, anyway, uh, that's just some of the stories. Some of them are uh, more tragic. Others are funny, and some are exciting. The combat scenes. I had the testimony of a boy that escaped from uh, Union Prison. Uh, at Point Lookout, and he had an adventure. Uh, and, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, you might find interesting if you uh, uh, love President Lincoln, uh, one of the uh, uh, first, uh, when the war took a nastier turn, happened in Athens, Alabama. It was taken by an Ohio regiment. Now, a lot of the people in Athens uh, were pro-Union. They flew the U.S. flag two months after Alabama seceded. But others were pro-Confederate. And uh, uh, shortly after the Yankees took it, the first Louisiana cavalry attacked, retook the town. And as the Union brigade moved smartly to the rear, uh, these people cheered. And... The cavalry went on to Huntsville. It didn't uh, stay in Athens. And the next day, uh, Colonel uh, Ivan Churchintoff, um, who was going under the alias of uh, John Basil uh, Turchin, uh, led his b brigade in there. They reoccupied the town, and he turned them loose. He said, uh, for two hours, you can do anything you want to. I don't care who gets killed, raped. Uh, robbed. I don't care what gets pillaged. They broke into the jewelry store. They raped a, uh, a young African-American girl. They raped a pregnant uh, woman who miscarried. Both, both she and the fetus died. And uh, it's really total havoc. Well, uh, the commander of the army uh, was Don Carlos Buell. And he was a gentleman. And the division commander was uh, Ornsby Mitchell, who was also a gentleman. And uh, Mitchell found out about it, and he told the uh, residents to file claims. And he uh, preferred charges against Turtoff. And uh, 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 Turtoff uh, tried to resign. Buell wouldn't let him. So, no, we're going to cashier you and dishonorably discharge you. We have no room in my army for people like you. And uh, he was convicted and uh, dishonorably discharged. Abraham Lincoln uh, set aside the conviction and promoted um, Churchin to uh, Brigadier General. Uh, and that sent a message to the whole Union Army and I think uh, kind of set the, the tune for the rest of the war. Uh, he Turchin later died in the mental institution, but uh, uh, it sent a message to the Union officers like Sherman is you can pretty much do what you want to. Mm -hmm. And there will be no repercussions for your actions. That's right. Um, shortly thereafter, there was an incident, <laughs> excuse me, in Palmyra. Uh, a Union informer disappeared. It informed on several uh, <coughs> pro-Southern residents. And uh, the Union colonel in the area, John uh, McNeil, ordered a Captain William uh, uh, Strahan to uh, execute 10 Confederate sympathizers if this informer was not returned. <coughs> and... Uh, uh, he picked out 10 people to kill, and the Confederate commander in the area was uh, 
uh, Colonel Porter. That's no evidence he even knew this was going on. But uh, uh, one of the men was uh, William T. Humphrey, who had a wife named Mary who loved him. And uh, uh, she went to uh, Strahan and uh, begged for her husband's life. Well, uh, Strahan said, yes, uh, if you will have sex with me and pay me $500, I will find another person to execute. And uh, she did. Uh, rather than have her husband killed, uh, they uh, had sex on the floor. And uh, she had her two-year-old uh, daughter with her. She set the child outside in the porch. Well, a couple of Union privates were walking by and they saw this little baby crying and they went to investigate and they looked through the window and saw uh, uh, Strahan having his way with uh, Mary and they reported it. And uh, the Union commander in the area uh, tried to cover it up, but he was unsuccessful. Uh, meanwhile, there was a boy named Hiram Smith, he was about 15, he was visiting one of his friends who was scheduled to be shot. And uh, uh, Strahan, uh, after he fit, had his way, the mayor came in and uh, 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 told uh, Smith that, well, uh, we're not going to execute Humphrey. We're going to execute you instead. And uh, they shot him a few minutes later. Hmm. And uh, President Davis uh ordered uh, 10 union people executed in retaliation for this. Uh, the uh, Theolopolis Holmes was a commander of Trans-Mississippi. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. Uh, and uh, President Lincoln uh, promoted McNeil to Brigadier General. And again, that sent a message. Uh, that however you treat Southern civilians is just fine with the Lincoln regime. Mm. Uh, that was a, kind of a sorry story, but um, the book covers the good and the bad. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, these stories need to be told. And yeah. then, I always liked Father Murphy down in New Orleans. Uh, he... Uh, always prayed for Jefferson Davis and uh, Spoons Butler was in charge there. also known as Beast Butler. They called him Spoons because he liked to change headquarters and he'd take over somebody's mansion and uh, stay there for a week or two. And then when they came back, all the silverware was gone. Uh, Butler got rich off of it. And uh, um, they told Father Murphy, cannot pray for Jefferson Davis anymore. So he would have uh, this congregation do 10 minutes of silent prayer instead. And uh, later uh, the Yankees would expel any preacher who uh, failed to pray for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I'm not sure how good a, uh, a prayer is if it's uh, done under duress, but uh, anyway, boom, uh, Spoons uh, got on to Father Murphy and said, uh, uh, here you uh, say you would refuse uh, to preside over the funeral of a Yankee soldier, and he chewed him out really good. And after he wound down, Father Murphy said, General, you are misinformed. Nothing would afford me greater pleasure than to perform the funeral service over you and all of your men. Uh, uh, Father Murphy was cool. <laughs> I'll say he had that. He already had my respect for his what the Lord called him to do, but that was just an awesome moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, he ended up in the Confederate Army anyway, but uh, a lot of the preachers did. They uh, had a great revival during this time. I cover that a little bit. Uh, a lot of people found the Lord. <clears throat> Matter of fact, they, uh, I remember once there's a couple of Texas infantry walking along the road and they came across a preacher. And uh, he asked, what uh, unit are you in? And they told him, well, the thus and so Texas Infantry Regiment. And asked the preacher, uh, what unit are you in? And the preacher said, I'm in the Army of the Lord. And the Texas uh, infantryman replied, uh, 
Uh, sir, you are a long way from headquarters. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's uh, kind of the gist of how the book uh, book goes. Did I miss anybody's question? Well, we have a couple, and uh, you know, I just wanted to say really quickly, you know, how awesome it is to hear stories from privates and from other soldiers you wouldn't necessarily hear. Because uh, I think you talked about this last time when we were discussing your book on the generals. You know, a lot of people and a lot of historians focus on the big names. Uh, I think me and uh, Commander Boshears ha had a fun conversation one night about how many books were written about Gettysburg because, you know, they're, they'll always sail. So to hear that uh, when you told me you were making a, a book on the stories of the common Confederate veteran, the common Confederate soldier, piqued my interest. And I, I told you to let me know whenever you want to come on and talk about it. And I have, I've never been so happy that we had you on because I've just been absorbed in this whole conversation. I've, I've loved every minute of it. Like I know the chat heads have, uh, there's been a lot of comments saying, you know, thank you for coming on, keep up the stories. We love them. And if you love the stories, I have the links for a couple of Dr. Mitchum's books that will be posted uh, towards the end of the stream. So you can have the time to go click on them and they'll take you to go buy his book. Uh, they're phenomenal books. I cannot wait to get my hands on that, vo that vo Voices of the Confederacy book. Uh, if I have to go that into my grandparents' brain as a, one of my Christmas books that I always ask for, it will be at, done. Uh, but we do have a couple questions. Uh, let's see here. Victor Smith asks, what are some of the most odd mascots that you've heard about during your research? Well, I had camels. I guess I was the oddest. Uh, a lot of them had dogs. But uh, you know, you're familiar with uh, Douglas the Camel down in Vicksburg. It was finally <laughs> till. Uh, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, most of them were mundane, like uh, horses or mules. Uh, I was a visiting professor at West Point, and that was the mas mascot, and I thought that was pretty appropriate um, <laughs> to have a mule as a mascot for army officer. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed West Point before it went woke. Yeah. I probably wouldn't let me on campus today. Um, Sad I think that's about it. Um, General Lee, of course, famously had a chicken. Um, <laughs> and, uh, he uh, get an egg every morning. He'd open up his tent door, and the chicken would waddle in and deposit an egg under his cot. And uh, uh, servant finally. Uh, uh, killed the uh, chicken without consulting General Lee. I think uh, uh, a harsher man would have uh, uh, lashed out at that. Lee Lee didn't. Um, Lee was uh, uh, Lee was a interesting fellow in that Overland campaign. He uh, apparently never got more than two hours sleep at one time. Uh, I don't see how he did it. He had the stamina of a horse. Um, <laughs> people don't realize that about Robert E. Lee. And his diet was primarily uh, cabbage and salt water. He'd eat meat about twice, twice a week. Wow. Uh, I didn't know that. Very interesting. I don't, uh, see, I don't see how he did it. Me either. But these, these great men often did some crazy things. Uh, Cousin Vinny asks, what was the most interesting thing you learned when you studied the War of Northern Aggression? Oh, I guess um, <clears throat> getting to know Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, I knew who he was, obviously, but I, uh, I never read a book about him. I never paid much attention to him. And uh, uh, over the course of my Civil War research, I picked up a book and, I mean, and read it, and I was hooked. 
and uh, um, I guess that's what I'm known for in the SCD now is uh, <laughs> bust hell wide open. Uh, and uh, although I did get more hate mail from it wasn't about slavery. Uh, I'm not uh, a my yeah. uh, my dad recently got that book, and uh, me me and my father are big Audible people, and a lot of your books are on Audible. Hint, oh. hint, the people that want Audible. Um, and he got he he bought the book, and he, we were listening to it. And uh, you know, I always mess with my dad because whenever I'd get out of the car for a couple, like uh, not on a trip, but like when we were just driving around town, I told him not to listen to the book without me. But every time I got in the vehicle, my father was a couple of chapters ahead of the point we were last when I was in the vehicle. And so I, I, I'm going to have to go back and reread your book because um, I, I heard like a couple of minutes of every chapter just, you know, riding with my father. So I don't have to pay for my own gas, uh, the life of a college student. But uh, <laughs> every couple of minutes, if uh, you didn't pay attention my dad would be uh, quizzing me on it. And that's something me, he used to do to me all the time. But he'd be sitting there, he'd slam the wheel. He'd be like, preach it, preach it, Dr. Mitchell. <laughs> oh. uh, he, he enjoyed that one. I'll, I'll tell you that much. And uh, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I hope, uh, Mr. David, that answers your question about Dr. Mitchum's thoughts on General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, <laughs> well, he... Uh... Uh, he was the greatest general of the war, in my humble opinion. Robert E. Lee agreed. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more either. He, and uh, General Sherman said he was the greatest cowboyman in American history. Oh, I didn't know that. No, oh, I yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah, was, and uh, in 1973, uh, there was a crisis. Uh, it looked as if Spain and the United States were going to go to war. And... Uh, Diplomacy later uh, postponed that war 25 years, but uh, the Panic of 73 had happened, and Forrest uh, volunteered to command the the uh, U, the U.S. cavalry in a, any war and with Spain. He sent a letter to uh, General Sherman, and Sherman got excited and hand carried it to uh, the Oval Office, uh, Ulysses S. Grant's president at the time and said, I want this man to command our cavalry if he gives the Spanish half as much trouble as he gave us, he will be a tremendous asset. <laughs> I thought that was cool. Um, they only, they only met, I guess you could say they met twice. They met at Fallen Timbers and Forrest came in a few feet of Sherman and uh, Sherman said if I uh, Forrest hadn't emptied his uh, revolvers, uh, breaking through our lines and overrunning our supports. My career would have ended then and there. But they ran into each other on a steamboat um, uh, you, you know, some years after the war. And uh, they went over, and um, unfortunately, there was no transcript of this conversation. Just the two of them. People heard bits and pieces. Uh, and it's the only time they sat down and talked. But uh, Sherman said when I was driving on Atlanta, um, uh, you gave me nightmares. Because, uh, he was supplying the whole army basically over one railroad. And uh, Forrest was a uh, past master at destroying railroads. And he said, I was worried that you were going to cut my supply lines. And... Uh, Forrest said, if Richmond had let me go, I would have made your nightmares come true. <laughs> uh, that was one of the, uh, Davis said it was one of the worst mistakes he made. He listened to uh, uh, his military advisors, uh, i.e., at that time, Braxton Bragg, and uh, didn't cut Forrest loose against Sherman's supply line. Uh, Forrest uh, didn't destroy railroads the same way that Yankees did or others did. You know, they like to uh, rip up the rails and uh, heat them in the middle and wrap them around a tree. Uh, Forrest considered that a waste of time. 
Uh, what he liked to do is make small fires and warp the rails. He didn't rip them up. It just uh, made them unusable. Uh, it might not have been but two or three inches, but two or three inches is enough to derail a train. You can't run a railroad over uh, places like that. So he just made little small fires. And to add insult to injury, uh, he used union cordwood that they'd cut for their own locomotives uh, to make these little fires. And uh, once the rails were warped, the Yankees uh, not only had to replace them, the first thing they had to do was pull up their own useless rails. So uh, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest was a military genius of the highest caliber, in my humble but accurate opinion. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> went over my head and hit me like a boomerang there. Oh, okay. um, if you have not noticed, everybody, that the chat is being flooded with a couple of links from uh, Dr. Mitchum's books from Bust Hell Wide Open to, of course, the book we are talking about now, Voice of the Confederacy. Uh, and we got the epilogue of Confederate generals also out there. And then I found the link for Dr. Mitchum on Amazon himself. So you can see all the books that he has on Amazon. Uh, let me let me not pull up my camp roster at the moment. Uh, let's see here. All right, and here is the link for Dr. Mitchum on Amazon. Now, I'm, I'm sure there's other ways you can get Dr. Mitchum's books. Uh, if he wants to talk about that, uh, if there are any other ways you want people to try to find your books, Dr. Mitchum. Well, uh, no, just local bookstores, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, uh, Post Hill Press is a publisher. I'm sure they want me to plug them. Um, <laughs> they're a good publisher. They are. I've had some that work. Um, the they got an author's page there. It has most of my books. Uh, had one come out in Polish the other day. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, so, oh, go ahead. I had one come out in Japanese, and it made me wonder because uh, uh, on the cover, the uh, uh, Measure Schmidt was shooting down the American airplane, and I couldn't read a word of the uh, Japanese. And, uh, you know, I told my wife, for all I know, this says, Die, Yankee Pig, <laughs> by the best selling author of Die, Yankee Dog. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> matter of fact, my uh, father fought in the Pacific World War II, and uh, he never uh, got over his hatred for the Japanese. And I'm glad you weren't there the day I drove up in my brand new Honda. <laughs> and, uh, your ears would have bled. <laughs> um, I was, and what I was going to do, I had it book come out in Japanese, two volumes set. Dad was always interested in my books. And uh, I was just going to tell him that I had a, I just wrote another book. And uh, he'd say, oh, yeah, what? He'd hand him this uh, Japanese book. I could hear him now. Uh, <laughs> what is this, Bravo Sierra? <laughs> and, can't say what he said on air, can we? No, we can't. And... Uh, <laughs> I say, yeah, Daddy, I decided you can't beat him, join him. My name is now Yamamoto Mitchum, son. And my wife said, uh, better not do that. He throw the book out the window. So I saw it. And uh, she said, yeah, but he might throw his oldest son out the window, too. That old veteran probably could have done it. So I didn't uh, didn't pull that particular stunt on him. <laughs> probably for the best. But uh... yeah. Uh, make sure to go support Dr. Mitchum and all his amazing books. Uh, again, I put all the links in the chat for Bust Hell Wide Open, uh, the Confederate Generals, Voices of the Confederacy, uh, and of course, a link to Dr. Mitchum's uh, Amazon profile itself. So uh, I would recommend clicking on that one. and You can dive deep into all the great books Dr. Mitchum has on Amazon. And, of course, try to find any other of his books. If they're not on Amazon, I would highly recommend it. Uh, I guess I think I need to plug. Yep. Okay. So please, please share this episode. 
and make sure to email scvyouthoutreach at gmail.com and you'll be featured on this week's episode of Look Around the Confederation. And it will be at the same Confederate channel and the same Confederate time, 7 o'clock. So I guess without further ado, I will say that we will have Christian Lee on to come on. And uh, as we talked about last week, uh, the SCV is celebrating uh, this month as Hispanic Confederate Heritage Month. Our Confederate, our, I think I said it wrong, but it's a Hispanic Confederate Month. And so in honor of that, we have invited Christian Lee to come on, the host of ACG Chat, one of our spinoffs, to talk about a monument that his camp is raising for the Tijano Confederate veterans. Uh, that will be a must-see episode, I would like to say. Uh, so make sure you tune in to look around the Confederation this Thursday. Uh, I guess without further ado, share the episode, share it with your friends, and I will see you guys Thursday. And remember, everybody, please thank Dr. Mitchell for coming on. He's always a great guest, and we're happy to have him on. And no Fumar in the elevator. Thank you very much.